We've all seen massive flying vehicle concepts, from things like the Arkbird to the Heli Carrier to my god awful Sky Cruise and the Sky Carrier. Even the airships from Project Wingman could technically fit this concept. What you may not know is that these aircraft could have been a reality. Admittedly, it's a little bit far fetched. But hello everyone, I am M82 and today I plan on building my best contender yet to the universe of fictional airships. And I plan on doing it as usual in Flyout. If you're wondering, Flyout is a realistic flight building game that plans to come out on Steam soon. You can join their server in the description below. Basically, to those of you clicking on this video, I'm sure you're expecting to see a giant flying battleship. Today I plan on detailing how I intend on making such a massive craft. As many of you know, in real life, airships of such a scale never really became a thing. There are many reasons for that. From scale, to material strength and fuel consumption, they were just about impossible to build in the first place. On top of that, there was never really a practical purpose for such a large aircraft. Perhaps its size or scale would attract interest, but it would be hard to give the aircraft a real true purpose. My wants for realism are constantly at war for my wants for huge airships, so naturally I spent a lot of time online and on the server trying to think of an at least somewhat realistic reason for such an aircraft to exist. I thought long and hard about many potential purposes of such a ship, until one finally struck me as I had just started the build. From my last video, and from some historical tests, many of you may know that nuclear engines were experimented with. The problem was, due to the weight of the radiation shielding, as well as the numerous problems and even a disaster that was run into while developing them, nuclear engines never really became fully designed. On top of that, the extra weight and size proved that nuclear engines could only really function on aircraft of a strategic bomber size or larger. Because of this, the project didn't really have an effective purpose and was therefore abandoned. And that leads us back to this thing. What happens when we combine two of these obsolete technologies without purpose? Well, normally, nothing happens. But in this case, both technologies complement each other very well. One brings the big, and the other brings the requirement of something big. Because of this, they don't just do nothing, they do a little bit of something. And that teeny little bit is something magical. I mean, it doesn't have a purpose yet, but we will get to that. But to understand how to give the vehicle such a purpose, first we must understand how it would work in the first place. So as you guys probably know, nuclear turbines are pretty simple. Traditional nuclear reactors use a fuel moderator and a control rod setup in order to heat up water through a heat exchanger. The water then turns into steam and moves onto a turbine, thus generating electrical energy. For more info on how the whole nuclear system works and how it can be transferred to an aircraft, you should check out my last video. But essentially, what if we were to use all this heat generated from a nuclear turbine to expand air similarly to the combustor in a jet engine? Well, if this system is designed correctly, it is very feasible that you can make your own jet engine. As long as the nuclear reactor, of course, stays powered, you can run your jet for an eternity. Of course, though, this does come with some problems. Otherwise, we never would have abandoned the idea, would we have? The main problem is weight. A reactor like this would weigh a ton and undoubtedly need a lot of radiation shielding. The US Air Force, after these tests, deemed these engines would be useless on anything smaller than a strategic bomber. The smaller it becomes, the more radiation shielding you need to sacrifice in the name of weight. And obviously you don't need to go irradiating someone's countryside. However, that would be a really funny weapon if the Geneva Convention didn't exist. Just get like a drone with a really crappy leaky nuclear reactor in the back and fly it over someone's country. Go crash it in like a capitol building or something. But the Geneva Convention exists and that is very, very, very messed up. And I mean at that point, why not just build a nuclear missile? More damage, more radiation, and faster. Or maybe you could make it like a nuclear crop duster. It's just, it just dusts everyone with radiation and flies by. Okay, you know, never mind. We're getting a bit too much off topic here. But, okay. So, I, earlier I said that if you make it smaller, you need to sacrifice the radiation shielding in the name of weight. But what if instead you made it bigger? Bigger leaves more wiggle room for redundancies, shielding, and safety. Problem is, there isn't really much use for an aircraft that's larger than a strategic bomber, is there? 
Well, I spent a lot of time digging through some old aircraft concepts for what was abandoned and why it was abandoned, from flying nuclear aircraft carriers to flying battleships, much like I titled this video, but I never found something that truly felt reasonable. Both aircraft carriers and battleship lacked something. With such an expensive vehicle, putting it on the front lines of some pointless conflict just sounds like a massive failed investment. Not only is it a waste of money, but you could have a potential nuclear crisis on your shoulders just for flying it. Or you know, maybe it'd be no different than a regular nuclear aircraft carrier. But I'm not really here to think about that because it seems a lot more likely to have a nuclear disaster or to be seen as a nuclear escalation with an aircraft such as this rather than a ship. Plus, since it's such a large plane, and you know, as it turns out, planes are easier to shoot down than boats are to sink, you could have a nuclear disaster a lot easier. So having it as this like breakthrough giant battleship whatever isn't really a good investment of your time or money. Instead, I believe this aircraft should at best fill a support role in the fleet. The thing should not go out without an entire battle group with the sole purpose of preventing it from being shot down. But even then, it still has problems. So I was kind of not very partial to the idea of a true breakthrough battleship. But then there was one concept that interests me quite a lot. It's not exactly a battleship or an aircraft carrier or something with a specific combat purpose, but boy would it be useful provided the infrastructure was in place. After all, the best feature of a nuclear aircraft is its range. A nuclear aircraft could stay airborne for not days or weeks, but maybe even months or years in the right scenarios. Plus, the capability of arming and flying a larger aircraft allows for you to have a very large sum of people or weapons or provisions on board while flying for months or years. It's theorized an aircraft of such may exist in real life, admittedly on a smaller scale, but what if your nuclear aircraft wasn't a combat vehicle that would get shot down, but a flying bunker? Let's say, for example, nuclear war was enacted. Now in the world I've been developing, commonly referred to as prop punk, it's an RPG based in the flyout world. More on that later. But the world that exists in there is constantly in crisis, and with the rise of nuclear weapons and superpower countries, the threat of nuclear war and total atomic annihilation is very real, and constantly real. With how many conflicts constantly happen, it's almost a tense matter of time before something happens. This is very similar to how we felt in the 50s as well. This vehicle won't just be a combat-capable airship, but some form of art. A seed of humanity can live on and even fight on past a nuclear war. Staying airborne for months or even years, this aircraft can wait for the fallout to clear, or find a spot with no fallout to land. Plus, if the world is dissolved by a nuclear conflict, there will no longer be aircraft or dedicated forces capable of taking this thing out. At best, you'd have uncoordinated attacks from SAMs or air forces, with robust countermeasures, MAW, SeaWiz, and anti-missile missile subsystems aboard this craft, dispatching these uncoordinated threats wouldn't be a problem. The nation of which harbor this craft could rise from the ashes, keeping their top scientists, citizens, and politicians aboard this flying ark. The thing packs most of the firepower and defenses of an entire battle group into its hull. With no coordinated forces left to contest it, the only way a country could attack this thing is if they had similar plans for post-nuclear weapon systems to destroy such aircraft. I mean, probably your best option at this point is very high-velocity anti-aircraft guns for shooting this thing down due to its robust countermeasures and sea whiz systems. But obviously, defense and combat capability is only a secondary goal of this aircraft. First and foremost, it needs the capability of carrying a large sum of people. As mentioned before, ideally, or in an ideal world, it would carry the top scientists and generals of a nation. However, this is not an ideal world, and we risk such an aircraft being shot down. Therefore, I believe that separate smaller aircraft should be built for politicians and scientists. This vehicle, in a good scenario, would carry mostly military personnel, diplomats, and perhaps the leader of a country. This is so the aircraft in non-combat scenarios can be flown to neutral countries, or in event of a total nuclear war, to the least irradiated area for peace conference talks. The small shuttle, or a small shuttle, will exit the craft to land where the conference would be held. 
This would also allow for supplies to be ferried on board the battleship without risking landing with the entire crew. Especially in the environment of a post-war world, unpredictable situations would undoubtedly make this a good idea fairly quickly. Also, while we talk about it, this thing was going to be massive. I mean, the final weight of the aircraft was over 34,000 tons. And that number means just about nothing. Let's take something everyone knows, the Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower weighs about 10,100 tons overall, meaning that this thing weighed more than three Eiffel Towers combined. So in other words, it was really, really heavy. And as it turns out, launching three Eiffel Towers into the sky is very difficult and wouldn't really be possible on a conventional runway. Even if the aircraft wouldn't have a 10 mile takeoff run, it would probably be unable to move simply from sinking into the runway from sheer weight. So obviously, we needed a better way of distributing this weight and launching the aircraft, and that would require some serious backup infrastructure. Spanning several miles long, the country developing this would need to set up the aircraft on the base of a gigantic mass relay. What does this mean? Well, imagine the catapult of an aircraft carrier, but much bigger and attached to a sled that the aircraft sits on top of. Oh yeah, it's also slightly angled upward so you can get off the ground. And you know, fairly into the air before launching. So for a nation planning on launching multiple large nuclear craft after total atomic annihilation, having a system of getting these ultra heavy aircraft off the ground reliably would be required. And being honest, I'm not sure anything would be able to hold it without some absurd mass dispersing technology. I mean, maybe it could, after all it was only 10 times heavier than the Saturn V rocket. When you put it that way, maybe it's possible, especially with, you know, appropriate weight dispersion, which is a lot easier on this thing since it's not vertical. You could also have a little crawler assembly, much like for rockets, if you wish to transfer other aircraft to the catapult. Well, now that it's in the air, how do you land it? What goes up must come down eventually. Basically, landing is a lot less uh, thought out than taking off. I thought personally it would have a set of emergency wheels that don't really function as gear but as something to keep the fuselage off the ground when you finally touch the thing down. After all it wasn't built to taxi or take off again, just keep itself intact on landing. And then from there, uh, the, the recovery crew could grab it, they could repair it because undoubtedly the aircraft would need to be spent, spend a long time, you know, dry docked and repaired after taking off. And then they can put it back on the crawler and put it at the base of the mass relay again. For anyone wondering what a crawler is, it's just those little things that they, they use to like transfer rockets to the launch pad on NASA's uh, territory. But I'm thinking of essentially just using them for our airships, or at least something similar to a crawler for our airships. But, I mean, that's, that's really everything the aircraft needed to do right there. It only took us like 17 minutes, I don't even know. I've been talking for a while, haven't I? But... As a final list, our craft needed to hold hundreds, if not more, of military personnel, diplomats, and the leader of a country. It needed to fly with a nuclear thermal indirect cycle turbine system. It needed to feature advanced CWIS, MAW, and EW technology, or, you know, just cutting edge defensive technologies. And it needed to have enough room for shuttles to ferry supplies and personnel when airborne. And alright, this was a pretty tall order, but I finally get to explain how to build this thing to you guys. Or maybe not how we built this thing, but just how I built this thing. Long story short, as you can see, there's a main fuselage, and then there's this box wing that we have going on, and then we get to the top. At the moment, I believe we're just plastering SeaWiz systems all over it. By the way, the SeaWiz systems are 8-barreled, 45mm proximity fused uh, turrets. So, uh, very effective maybe, who knows. But long story short, there's going to be actually two different reactor cores in the center of this thing, surrounded by obviously appropriate radiation shielding and water, and then we will have a radiator system hooked up to them from the outside, that way we can keep all our metals in appropriate temperature ranges. This could also allow us finer control of the engines, allowing us to significantly cool the reactor in the event of needing to throttle down, which is always nice. So we now have control rods and a radiator system for helping us moderate our throttle. And that is all more or less in the center of this aircraft. That's because it is the most protected spot. So in any event of impact, it will hopefully not get damaged. From there, spanning out onto the wings, we have 10 separate nuclear turbines, which are powered by this uh, thermal reaction. 
Ideally, I would have had four nuclear turbines, or that's what I would have liked to have, but um, we reached a size limit in the game where not even file editing could get me a larger engine than what I already had there. So I made them a little bit more powerful than my initial goals were, and I just made them more plentiful because I couldn't physically make them the size I wanted to make them, because ideally they would have had almost double the diameter of what they currently have. And then you will see the bridge is actually on top of this little box wing setup, which was a rather unique choice. The reason I chose this spot is because you still get very high visibility of the craft, but it's far more protected than putting the bridge in the front of the craft. Also, in the event of an emergency, the highest class of people on the ship, such as the leader of the country and the pilots and the high-ranking people aboard this ship, would more or less be housed up here. This makes it so, in the event of an emergency, escape is by far the easiest. That's another thing, ideally a ship like this would probably have several escape pods across it. And I did plan on at least modeling this, even if it can't work properly. That's another thing, guys. In Flyout, there are no nuclear engines. Um, all of this is just simulated. I'm simply using the infinite fuel thing to fly and adding an absolute crap ton of weight to my aircraft and then reducing the combustor temperature of the engines to simulate what an actual thermal nuclear indirect cycle turbine would act like. Now, something else you may notice as we're building here is we have a lot of black domes across the aircraft on little pods. You know what? These are all radars. There are radars up and down this aircraft looking forwards, backwards, to the sides, all that. And I mean, they're just tiny little pods on the wingtip, but realistically, these radars are like as large as an AWACS radar, most of them. They are gigantic, and it's just because this aircraft is so large you don't really get to see this. The final wingspan of this aircraft was literally over a kilometer wide. This thing was gigantic. That's another thing, is that this thing would actually have an inside to the wings that you could probably walk through and access, so there would genuinely be a point where you could walk through a full kilometer of the craft just to get from one side to the other. On the wingtips, we had radar pods, as well as electronics warfare antennae that you can see, which actually massively expand our wingspan there. But, I mean, they're meant for electronics warfare and protection, so of course, we're gonna want them as powerful as we can get them. At this point, all these radars and electronics are gonna be a bigger radiation warning than the actual reactor. And then also something you'll notice we've been building recently is the actual defenses for the aircraft. There's missile turrets and Sea Whiz turrets on the wings. And of course, another thing is, since we're talking about the interior of the wings, there are access bays to both the Sea Whiz turrets and to the engines through the wings. That's why the engines are so close to the wings, so that way you can perform maintenance on them while in flight although the actual maintenance of them in flight would be rather difficult. I didn't end up modeling them, but I wanted to model them. Uh, we had to keep this thing a little bit shorter just for the sake of getting this video out within a week to you guys. By the way, I recorded everything, like all the videos you've seen, I've recorded like several days in advance, and I kind of just worked double time since I had a lot of free days, so that way I could actually spend a lot of time working on this thing. But in order to keep it short, I didn't model this. I wanted to have uh, panels that would close up around the engines, that way they could be worked on in flight without, you know, killing whoever tried to work on them. Also, you'd probably want to bring your radiation suit. And earlier I mentioned I might do a um, liquid sodium moderator instead of a wa high pressure water mo moderator for this system. I don't think that's really a good idea. We probably want the least exotic materials possible. That way, if they need to be changed in flight, we can do that. Especially like an engine being maintained like this. You'd need like, because it would solidify under, you know, when you when you stop the reactor, or cut off the engine from the, the, from the flow. So it would end up being very problematic to actually work on a system like this. Also, that would be a direct heat exchange as opposed to an indirect heat exchange. That would just be, maybe the inside of the reactor would have that as a heat exchanger and then it would just be pressurized water everywhere else. But yeah, working on these things would be a little bit difficult, but that's fine. And uh, I mentioned it earlier, I'm all over the place. I had the bridge up top for the high level personnel and of course the pilots and all that, which was a little bit separated from the rest of the craft, you'd still be able to access the rest, of course. Then you had the nuclear reactors in the middle, and then in front and in the back, there were extra seats, cargo area, um, living quarters, mess hall, all that stuff is contained within the aircraft. 
Based on the size of the aircraft, I would not be surprised if we could hold upwards of 1,000 people in a somewhat reasonable living space. Of course, it's not going to be perfectly reasonable. I'm willing to bet that the people in here are going to not have that much space in their room. But it would, it, it would be reasonable. It could reasonably fit that many people, I think. And you know what, guys? I actually do get to do a lot of interior building today. Now you guys actually get to see me shamelessly steal assets from Hot Dog's cockpits. But long story short, that's the gist of the ship. Right now, we're just doing paint and cockpit. Obviously, I don't do the full paint development with you guys, because I want you guys to see the final product and go, ooh, pretty, for the montage, that is. But we do the cockpit here. We add a, um, in the middle there, there's a bunch of, like, green and yellow and red lights. That's basically, like, a reactor temperature gauge. And what's kind of cool is the next update, they're adding a new input system to the game for this sort of stuff, so I could literally model the physical temperature of the reactor and like when I throttle up I could put that that the lights go all the way up to the yellow instead of on the low green so I'm really 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 excited for the new input system that they're adding next update to fly out anyways that means we are just about done with the aircraft here with our flying doomsday machine ready we were ready to fly